Two years and 11 months since I have been in Canada, but I am back and that means only one thing, a visit to our good friend, Peter Clute, otherwise known as the mayor of the classic no, car. No, no, Bruce is the mayor. No, Bruce is the emperor and, and I would like to say that he sends his, his, his well wishes and I, to I you. said mine. <laughs> I'm a small city mayor. How's oh, that? Oh, come now. Yeah. And I'm going to prove to you why he's not a small city mayor. We're going to look at some of the collection he's got. It always changes because that's what this man does. So this one I'm particularly excited about. This mm -hmm. is my favorite Ferrari, believe it or not. I, I think, it, I mean, it's the first supercar. Now, why do you say that? Well, it's first Ferrari supercar. When you, you know, it was carbon Kevlar, it was big horsepower, twin turbo, uh, great handling, uh, rare, like super low numbers. You look at it and you're like, it looks a lot like a 308, but then there's these small details. Why don't you point out right. some of the details? So a 308 on steroids, because there is nothing 308 on it. You know, the if you look at the shape of the quarter panels, it's obviously got the GTO, the nod to the GTO uh, uh, louvers there. Uh, the rear deck is totally different. The rear spoiler, the stance is different. Uh, obviously the engine, you know, with the twin turbos. It is, it is a subtle supercar. It's kind of like, you know how you get excited about the Singer? <laughs> well, this was, this was Ferrari's version of a 308, what it could have been. They had this great car that had, you know, looks, it had horsepower, it had low numbers, and it became an instant collectible. And so, that's, that's really what started the whole supercar era. Like, I, I think you can make an argument that the GTO is the beginning of the supercar era. And obviously the first, 1985, when you think of supercars, you really don't think of anything prior to 1985. It was, it was the same for almost every brand. It wasn't just Ferrari. You know, there was a, there was a lull in the world, mm. you know, you had insurance problems, you had the gas crunch, you had a bunch of problems, and it wasn't really, it was for a 10 year period, you know, call it, or 15 year period, from the early 70s to the mid 80s, that nothing really was exciting. You know, and it didn't matter if you're European brands or domestic mm. brands, and Corvettes weren't really exciting. No, they between, had, what, 150 horsepower at right. most. And then in 84, when the C4 came out, the excitement went up a huge notch compared to Yeah, a whopping previous. 190 yeah. horsepower, I believe. No, but I mean, you had a really good handling car on a new platform. Yep. And I think it was like that with everybody. For 15 years, it was, you know, uh, the dark ages. Shaker hoods, uh, just loud, obnoxious cars in great colors and great performance. This is a 340 um, with a stick, stunning restoration. Just, it's a, it's a fun car and obviously if this were a 71 hemi cuda convertible you'd be talking four million bucks you could get a 440 six pack which would be more valuable um you could get a 383 you could get a 340 i mean there's a lot of options available put aside the money forget the valuation of these cars for a minute mm -hmm. but from a drivability perspective which is the best option in this car drivability only um i mean probably a single four. I mean, you always have the tuning aspect yeah. of multi-carbs. So the six packs or the two four barrels, are, yeah. you know, can be a workout. Um, so a single four would be the most drivable. We talked about the, uh, the Dodge Charger SRT Daytona concept, the electric concept yeah. in a different episode. They're bringing this back. Oh, cool. They, this is all over that new Dodge yeah. uh, EV concept. Something tells me you're gonna see this in more uh, Dodge cars, not just that Charger concept. Right. We have to look at this. This is a car that, very famous, mm -hmm. but a little bit behind the scenes for me, I never liked these when they were new. I thought the cheese grater thing was ugly, but now, kind of like a 73 Riv, I almost like it. I, I, and I think they're, they're you know, the Miami Vice car. Yeah, of course. Or, you know, the single mirror car, everybody thinks of that. And really good performance, relatively inexpensive mm -hmm. exotic, and especially when you compare it now to the Countach. The Countach has just gone ballistic. Now, the exception to this is the 512M, mm -hmm. which is now 
probably the same money as the Countach. 512M, which looks very similar, obviously has the lights. Didn't in the, have the cheese grater. Right. It, it is 700 plus. Why is that? Why is that cost? Numbers. Numbers. And I think that's, again, going back to the 4GT, I think numbers is a big deal for people collecting. Tell us about this one. Why does this one stand out? So mileage, and, and that's one of the factors with collector cars is, you know, they're, they're good looking cars from the era. Mm -hmm. um, and now it comes down to condition and mileage. And this one is a 5,000 mile car. So it's a special car for somebody. And again, relatively cheap you know and this was built car. right just down the road wasn't sure it? In, oshawa. in oshawa okay so putting aside camaros another kind of muscle car um they're up and coming and what's what's interesting is we got one of those gtr 50s which was the 50th anniversary mainly a, a cosmetic package but trick you mean the car. r35 the new one yeah no that one they well. built you know yeah big numbers and it'll be interesting to see if those that drags up all these cars. And again, we had this discussion on one of your other programs about what constitutes a supercar. Is a GTR the supercar for these guys? I think it is a supercar. Yeah. It just arrives there in a different way. Yeah. Like you and I get behind the wheel of that 05 GT. It's got a pickup truck engine. It's a Ford, blah, 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 but it's still fast. Yeah. This, it's crazy fast, at least the new one. It's crazy fast but it's not as engaging of an experience. And people kind of crap on them because of that. I, I think that's the wrong direction. I think you should have respect for it because it's such a technological marvel. So an interesting tidbit about these things. We have a friend bought one of these. I think his was an R34 or an R33. Three. I think, yeah, R30, he bought it for like 40 grand. Hmm. Sold it for 60, still left 40 grand on the, the table. table. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, now we've got to go and see the piece de resistance. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there's a couple of them in here. We've got the Countach, yep. which you already told us what these things are worth. Yeah, they're, and these they're have gone up a lot in, in a short huge, period of time. Huge again. So, you know, they used to be roughly years ago, the same money as a Testarossa, and now they've just eclipsed them, other than the 512. Yeah. You know, the M. Um, they're... They're not a great car to drive, but they're just so iconic. I mean, mm -hmm. you had the Countach and Farrah Fawcett when you were a kid. Of course. In your room. And I think that that's driving that market for sure. It's the boomer that remembers it, that just, it's not about the driving experience. It's just about the look of the car. Same question I asked you in another episode. Is this car bringing in new people to the market? It is too. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely getting boomers, but you're also getting younger people that are looking at the newer Lamborghinis, and they've done a great job of their marketing. And when Audi bought Lamborghini, I mean, they took it from a good car to really a great performing car. I mean, they... they Which you could use every day. You could use every day, great track car. I mean, they're, they're a fabulous car today. And I think what it did is it reinvigorated people to you know, some of the early cars, mirrors. True or false, would you consider these a blue chip collectible? Absolutely. Like this they built a lot of them, but the styling is just timeless. They're beautiful cars to look at. They're beautiful cars to drive. Um, you know, the brand Mercedes, you know, with what they're doing in, or had done up until this year in Formula One, mm. um, and then with the sale of that SLR for 142 million, I think it just brought to light how iconic a brand Mercedes is. And we've seen a little uptick in the mm -hmm. Benzes at Pebble Beach. You know, they were a little stronger than they were before. When you say uptick in Mercedes, is it just Mercedes of this value or like a hundred thousand uh, dollar classic a, Pagoda? A good 280 SL today is 200,000. Oh, are they that much now? Right. So I think you've seen an uptick in the brand and I think that, you know, the, the 300 SL where they're going or Roadster mm. is just always going to be in every major collection. And if the guy has multiple cars and has, you know, classics from the 50s mm. that, uh, you know, are, are multiple marks, almost always every good collection has well, a 300 SL. Well, we know the Emperor, he's got both. Yes. And he's got two beautiful ones. Yeah. It, what's going on with the value between a Roadster and a, and a, and a I think Gold right Wing? now I think they, the Roadsters went up, right? And now the Gold Wings, just recently, I would say after Pebble Beach, I would say a Gold Wing is 
20% stronger than a Roadster, at least. Oh, so that's recent. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So they, they've always, historically you would always say a Gullwing was worth more and then it, they almost kind of leveled out and now the Gullwing's gone again. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to what I would call the piece de resistance. Mm -hmm. Or shall we say the undervalued car of the collection? Yeah, I think the XJ220, again, a great looking car, um, fast car, sleek, super low numbers, has all of the ingredients to make a run. And these, give me an idea, just ballpark, what are these worth now? Um, six to 700, depending okay. on miles. And that's a 054 GT. How much is that worth? 400 and a Heritage would be 700. So this is the same money as a Heritage. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense at all. No. Why is that? Maybe there's a correction coming. Okay. Well, with, with that, we know that this, this gentleman has two of them. So if one wants an XJ220, mm -hmm. this is your man here, and this is why he's the mayor of the classic car hobby. I cannot thank you enough for this great having short again. tour. Yeah. Always great seeing you, and we have to hang out again. Uh, we did a couple of other episodes more about the market, and you gave a lot of detail, so we'll put those out over time. Uh, but in the interim, I have to turn this around to the audience. Uh, perhaps we ask them their favorite that they saw in the collection today. Perfect. Okay. Let us know in the comments below or via our social media. Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, and with that, uh, do you know what I drove up in today? Some sort of Benz. Some sort of Benz. Not just some sort of Benz, excuse me. I drove up in a hybrid because I know how much of a green guy you are. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Okay. <laughs> We're going to say goodbye to Peter until we see you in the next episode. Peace, Peter.